Hi, this is Debbie Goldstein from Art Rep DG. This is my second podcast. Welcome. The title of the podcast is The How is the What? And this is about Jasper Johns, um, the painter, who some of you may know and some of you may not know. But I hope that at the end of this, you may know a lot more about him. He is one of my favorite painters. And I recently made a, a pilgrimage to New York and Philadelphia, where there is a gigantic exhibition. One, uh, one is at the Whitney and one is at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. They're both the same show. It's called Mind Mirror. And um, I think it was Robert Smithson who said that art makes you travel. And in this case, he was right because seeing the work at the Whitney and then getting on the train and going to Philadelphia is a great experience. And the shows are going to close in February. So if you have a chance to see them, I would urge you to see them. Because imagine Jasper Johns is still living. He's 91 years old. And uh, there are over 500 works in these exhibitions. So imagine what it's like to have to um, gather 500 works. What that means for people who don't really know about museums is that you have to identify the work, you have to write to the collector, you have to assure them that there's insurance and all kinds of things, and then you have to ship it to the museums. And it's just a really long process. Um, and in this case, it took five years. So one thing about Jasper Johns is that uh, he's, while he's a prolific painter, he's also a prolific writer. And I wanna just read you one quote uh, that is my favorite quote that might tell you a little bit about him and then I will begin talking about the work. Um, it has been about covering the fissures. The spy and the watchman are forces engaged in endless opposition and in endless reflection of one another. This is John's vision. This is my vision of what it means to be an artist. His reluctance to explain, confess, describe or theorize goes against the behavioral drift of contemporary artists. He knows that connections are conditional and temporary, that identities change or erode, that lack unai separate him not only from the world, but from himself. He knows that nothing is what it appears to be and that the self is made up of false presences. So keep that in mind as we talk about some of the work. So <clears throat> when he first began, he was living on Pearl Street in the 1950s, and he was living in a loft below Robert Rauschenberg, and he and Robert Rauschenberg were lovers. And so the two best gallerists of the time, Leo Castelli and Ileana Sonneben, were coming to do a studio visit to Robert Rauschenberg's loft to see his work. And as they began talking, they talked about this new artist that they had heard, whose name was Jasper, that they had heard about, whose name was Jasper Johns. And uh, Bob Rauschenberg said, well, gosh, he lives downstairs. And so uh, Leo Castelli and Ileana Sonneben got really excited and they said, oh, could we meet him? So they immediately went downstairs and met Jasper Johns. They immediately fell in love with the work and they even bought some and they arranged for him to have a show. Um, which was uh, quite a blow to Robert Rauschenberg and quite a blow to their relationship. Uh, and so uh, it's art world lore that this huge uh, rift existed for uh, 50 years, which uh, wasn't entirely true, but um, it's what, you know, people in the art world like to talk about. Um, so what happens was that, uh, in the early days, John started painting things, targets, flags, maps. And so one has to keep in mind that the flag is a picture of a flag. It is always the painting 
And it is an illusion of a thing and not the thing itself, which is very uh, important to think about. In 1980, the painting that you see uh, here uh, sold to the Whitney for $1 million, um, which was the highest price a living artist had ever gotten at that time. Uh, and it is still, it is one of the paintings that you, you see when you first walk into the Whitney. Now, um, <clears throat> there is uh, something called the Stendhal syndrome. Uh, and the Stendhal syndrome is uh, a physical response rapid heartbeat, possible painting, fainting, confusion when exposed to objects of beauty, of great beauty or antiquity. Now, I have experienced the Stendhal syndrome twice in my life. One was when I went to the Manet retrospective uh, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Do you remember when people had those day books, you know, before mobile phones and everything else? And in the day book, you had your, um, uh, your phone, you know, your phone numbers, your calendar, uh, any specific notes that you wanted. It was sort of a handsome leather bag. Um, so I took my day book and I went up to see the show and I was just, uh, it was before I had ever gone to Paris to see the work in the Louvre or the Musée, Musée d'Orsay. And I thought when I saw some of these works that um, I had only read about, uh, I have to say the Stendhal syndrome came about because uh, I was so moved and taken by this that when I got in the cab and went back down uh, downtown, I realized that my day book had somehow been sacrificed to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and that I got confused and somewhere just left it uptown. Uh, so that was my first Stendhal syndrome. And then the second time was a couple of weeks ago when I was in New York looking at this painting called Map. Um, from Jasper Johns. And what happened was that there's this beautiful, um, I mean, it's this beautiful, beautiful painting. Um, and I sat in front of it. And it, I have to say what's interesting is it wasn't the first time that I've seen this painting, but somehow seeing it now, there was a bench in front of it and I sat in front of the bench and I sort of looked at the painting and I actually started crying. I, I, I just thought it was so beautiful. Like I could feel tears running down my face, which um, again was just because I, I was so moved by this painting. Um, when you look at the maps, it, it is really interesting because there are no labels to give us the kind of information that we find in maps. Boundaries are blurred in certain areas. The shapes of the states are not meant to convey their identity and location, but they have a meaning as um, abstract paintings making up a larger design. And that uh, that is um, sort of, uh, we are basically familiar with what we're looking at but um, brush strokes obscure the boundaries in many places. The names of the states are labels and brush strokes add texture. And you can see that um, Johns is using brush strokes to establish the flatness of the surface and creates very, very shallow layers of space. Now, what you notice in Johns's work is that he uses a, a medium called encaustic which is wax. You have to sort of melt the wax, add, pig, add pigment, you know, color pigment, and then sort of paint with it. Um, it is uh, very laborious, very painstaking. But you see that when you look at the map, it is, uh, you know, the colors are perfect. Uh, you can see that he's sort of learned how to use encaustic in a masterful way. Um, the painting just sings, it just sings. And you know, when you think about maps, 
you know, I always think about it like, how do they know that those boundaries or borders are exactly right? And uh, I know John's once made a statement about when you fly over the country, you don't really know where the borders are. And I, I always thought that that was that was pretty much the case. Very true. Very true. Um, so uh, what is interesting is that. Um, again, even for these two shows, uh, people make a big deal about the rift between Rauschenberg and um, Johns. And Rauschenberg very famously said that he wanted to live in the gap between art and life. And it is my feeling, uh, my conjecture, that really Johns sort of shows you what life is about, that there is no gap. Um, and so one of the things to keep in mind about John's is the difference between looking and seeing. And so we'll, I'll go back to that. Um, I remember when I lived in New York, or, or let me start over. You know, when you go to Beverly Hills, they have these maps of the stars and you can, um, either self do it or you can get on a tour bus and they'll tell you this is where, you know, Cary Grant or Madonna or whoever lives. And you kind of, you know, drive by thinking, oh, I know where Madonna lives. Well, in New York, I think for us kind of art nerds, um, it was always sort of uh, uh, exciting to know where uh, these famous artists lived. And John's lived in this um, old neoclassical bank building on Houston Street. And um, the times that I would drive, that I would be driving by and I would see a light on and I would think, oh, you know, Jasper John's is in there. But I never really sort of thought about what it was that he was doing and how it was that he was making these incredible paintings. I also want to say that when I was in uh, graduate school in school, um, I left in 1977 and, uh, you know, way back when. And um, he uh, he hadn't really done the kind of work that, uh, you know, he is sort of much more known for now. He had done the targets, the flags and the maps. And then, uh, coincidentally, in 1977, um, I, I think his work changed quite a bit. Um, so, uh, he's one of my favorite paintings, which I'm going to show you, is um, a painting called Scent. And uh, I could probably talk for hours about this. It was painted uh, in 1973. And it's what's called a crosshatch motif or motif. And Johns said that he was driving uh, back from Long Island in his Cadillac, which, you know, has a certain charm all of its own. Um, and he noticed this uh, crosshatching on a car and uh, he he really liked it. And I, I have to say that I think the thing that makes John's John's is that he is the king of um, the put a pin in it um, because he will see something like the cross hatching, remember it. And then sometime later it will show up in a painting and that is exactly what happened with these cross hatchings. He saw the 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 you know pattern, and um, by the way, it looks exactly like the pattern on a, a painting by Edward Munch called "Between the Clock and the Bed." And uh, Johns uses the cross hatch motif for a very very long time. Um, and what happens in these paintings? They are so beautiful um the the sort of the overall capture of this uh work is called yusuyuki which is a japanese word which means um lightness 
of snow, but it also is the fleeting quality of beauty in the world. And I think doing so many paintings with this crosshatch motif uh, really talks about the fleeting beauty, uh, the fleeting quality of beauty in the world. And again, sort of goes back to the Stendhal syndrome. You know, when, when you see something um, that's beautiful, you want to find a way to not only uh, encapsulate it, but give it to the viewer so that the viewer can have some idea about what you are talking about. Um, to illustrate that, I went to see a show in Phoenix um, a few years ago. It was a, a very small show of Michelangelo drawings. And it was just really beautiful. I mean, to begin with, you know, is there a better draftsman? Probably not. But the idea that Michelangelo is um, uh, reaching out from 500 years ago, 600 years ago uh, to my life right now and making me sort of see what he sees or see what he experienced is probably the most rewarding part of looking at art. And I think that that's what happens when you look at John's work, because it's not always easy to know what you're looking at, but once you sort of figure it out, you're seeing what he wants you to see. You're seeing what he thinks, um, what he is experiencing. And it, honestly, is there any greater experience than when you're looking at art? Because uh, the work is beautiful. You know, you have this sort of beautiful, sensual uh you know, color surface that is, okay, pleasing to the eye. But once you start to sort of uh, uh, parse it and see what the meaning is and you go, whoa, it is like for me and evidently for all these people in New York and Philadelphia, just one of the most meaningful art experiences that you can have, which is why I say, get on a plane, go to the museum, uh, go to both museums. I would see both shows definitely and experience this work because it, in a way in our lifetime, this will never happen again because first of all, John's is alive, which is fantastic. He's 91 years old and had a great deal of um, input to this uh, show. And uh, the, the gargantuan collection of work, um, we will never be able to do it again. I, I, I just can't imagine that in this sort of post whatever uh, age that collectors will let their work be shown and uh, will ship it here and there. And, and also there's very few artists that have that the amount of work that Jasper Johns has. It's six decades at least of work. So let me talk a little bit about this work sent. On the right, um, you have a section that's painted on a sized canvas. Oil and varnish are added to increase glossiness. Um, in the middle, uh, the, the, it, it, is the, it is painted on unsized canvas. There's no oil or varnish. The paint sinks into the canvas, giving it a very matte or flat surface. And the third section on the left is painted in encaustic. The, the physique, the bones of the painting embodies the thought, allowing one to sense these thoughts at different times. It is lean and airy and ordered. Um, elements unify um, the different surfaces, those cross hatch, hatch marks. Um, the overall compositional structure is present. The, um, the brush stroke here conveys the meaning, which is revolutionary. It, it, that's an amazing thing to think about. Um, all of these systems interlock. Um, it is a map of 
actions, which lends itself to the very process of making. Um, the literal fragrance is the paint medium. Keep in mind, this is a work called Scent, S-C-E-N-T. The title suggests uh, the presence of something masked in lush brushstrokes. The structure is hidden, but not, but it, it's hidden, but also sensed. The scent is discovered by the eyes, not the nostrils. The scent, the, I'm sorry, the sight looking at it can determine the source of the scent. And more than that, scents also linger. And that I think is what you have with this painting. Um, it, it, uh, it lingers, you, you look at it and you think, wow, well, is this possible? Uh, that these sort of abstract marks can be so meaningful. And again, once you sort of know what the painting is about, it takes on a whole new um, significance. Um, so I would say these Yusuyuki Yusi, Yusi paintings are just so important to be seen in real life. Um, and I would, again, urge you to go see them. I wanna talk about another painting called In the Studio. This is um, again, uh, uh, a tour de force about modern art and its uh, absorption of a self-referential world. For here you have a painting, but you also have um, a stick which sort of leads the viewer from natural space to the painting surface. The modernist flat plane is established by this nail that you see, uh, which is trompe l'oeil, you know, a trick of the eye, because it has actual shadows, even though it's a painting, it's, it's painted. You see his handprint, which sort of, uh, in, you know, is indicative of um, him, you know, the, the presence of the artist. Um, John's arms the viewer with uh, an explicit view of his outlook and a sense of inspiration. Because again, painting, no matter how literal, is always an illusion of the thing and not the thing itself. Sculpture, in this case, stick, shortens the distance between art and life. There is another painting called Corpse and Mirror. What Johns has to say about this painting is, we say one thing is not another thing, or sometimes we say it is, or we say it is the same, which means what he's talking about is the process of identification. Um, it requires the viewer to um, close, uh, close inspection to discern the differences between apparently like entities. Um, the more correct uh, entity is painted on the left, painted in oil. The altered version on the right is painted in encaustic, um, which follows the rule of right reading. Um, in oil, Johns has divided the canvas into three horizontal sections separated by distinct grooves in the paint surface. Um, surrealists used to call this method exquisite corpse, where several artists contribute to a single work, each starting with an edge of what had been drawn previously. The vertical division in the second canvas paints a mirror image of the left half in encaustic. In a different medium with newsprint underneath, um, he, the image on the right proclaims a, a, a uniqueness, a kind of uh, individualness but it is a divided state of being. The mirrored image has a residue left from the world of events imbuing with it a degree of vulnerability. 
The right side is an arena of exaggerated actions and interruptions. The former is given, the latter is a contradiction. Large X, the vertical slash, there's an imprint of an iron and gray large areas of encaustic that blot out extensive sections of black and white patterns. This is a memory of life. Um, the mirror reflects a living individual and the photograph and the mirror exhibit uh, and the mirror shows life at different stages. This is a moody, a passive aggressive uh, uh, and an abstract strategy that passes from the scent of an individual to the darker aspects of life. When you talk about looking at these paintings, um, you know, millions of words have been given to John's meanings and, um, you know, what they think he means and what he thinks he means uh, is really just uh, uh, a hedge uh, against truth. And um, none of that is true. None of that is true because you can find meaning in the work. You can, you know, luxuriate in the, the surfaces that are uh, encaustic. You can luxuriate in, you know, the, the uh, uh, brush strokes and how it is done. Uh, and you can be rewarded again by what it is that you're seeing. And so the last painting that I really wanna talk about uh, is actually two paintings um, called Racing Thoughts. One is from 1983 and one is from 1984. The one from 1983 is largely red, yellow, and blue. And the one from 1984 is more black and gray. But when you look at it, it is a viewpoint from a bathtub. <laughs> um, and it is a, 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 a torrent of 2D images. And really what these images do is they indicate the ways that they might be related to the wall, including nailed, taped, framed, hung, silhouetted, imagined, or embedded. Here again, the background is divided into a diptych consisting of a, of a conventional wall and a wood grain door from his house in Stony Point. The lettering is cut off on top of the right side. Uh, it's, it's cut off on top of the right side and then picked up again on the left side of the same section. Unifying this side are the parade of pictures and the repetition of wood surfaces. The motif, um, they all possess personal associations for John's. Uh, you uh, can see this picture of Leo Castelli, who was his dealer um, after that momentous meeting uh, when he was supposed to see Rauschenberg. Um, he was his dealer for many, many years. There is a reproduction of the Mona Lisa without her customary landscape background but her name is painted yellow um, and it has a kind of wanted poster uh, effect. And it allows the artist to refer to Leonardo da Vinci, Marcel Duchamp, as well as Barnett Newman. You can see the two faces um, that make up the uh, vase, which are Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip. So it's kind of a, a domestic museum for the artist. Johns recycles his own images and he intermixes very influential works. The doubleness of identity, appearance and meaning, and meaning sorry, underline, underlies every image. Um, you see a warning for an avalanche. It is a Swiss sign. Um, that, and then you see uh, a skull, which uh, could uh, uh, refer to one of his early collectors, the Skulls, um, who ran a taxi, ca taxi cab company. And um, 
you can see that this work, these two works, again, catalog the kinds of art one can make. Um, you can do like Barnett Newman and use compositional structure. You can do Leonardo, something that's um, extremely representational. These are depictions of illusory and multiple aspects of life. Um, and it makes you know huh, that interpreting existence is an altogether subjective activity. Um, <clears throat> the world contains easily perceived recognizable features and less quickly understood aspects, altogether mysterious parts. And hence the name of this painting is Racing Thoughts. Um, I think that um, I'd like to uh, end here. Uh, and I also would like to say that uh, there's, there's so much to know in this world. And I think we use artists to help us find our way in it. And I think that there's no better artist to do that than Jasper Johns. Um, I met him a couple of times. Um, I wanted to see a show at the Philadelphia Museum several years ago. And I'd scheduled my trip and uh, I came on the wrong day. And um, I went down to where the exhibit was and I realized my mistake and that I couldn't see the show. And all of a sudden Jasper Johns walked by me and I thought, mm, you're never going to get another opportunity like this. So I, I kind of tapped him on the arm and said, oh, I came from California to see the show. It's the wrong day. I love your work. And he sort of grabbed my arm and he opened the door and he um, shouted to the curator, Mark Rosenthal, I have a friend here. Can I come show her the work? And I, I was, you know, um, gulping like I am now. And uh, he brought me in and we started walking around and he was talking about the work. And, I, you know, it was one of those experiences where I could have died right there and been happy. It was just so extraordinary. And then the curator needed him to sort of help fix some stuff. And, um, and so I thanked him and, you know, continued to see the show and just, you know, walked out of there again with the uh, Stendhal syndrome, a little bit confused, a little bit um, amazed at what I had just seen. And a few years after that, I was at a, a dinner for the artist Robert Morris, who had just had a, a retrospective at the Guggenheim. And so I was invited to the dinner afterwards, which probably had about 20 people. And Jasper Johns was there. By then, I had been teaching him for several years and was very familiar with his work. And uh, uh, my friend Ramon, you know, was thrilled to meet Jasper. And I just went up to him and I asked him if he remembered me. And of course, he didn't. Um, and um, but I thanked him and I told him how much I liked his work. And being the Southern gentleman that he was, he said, thank you so much. And, you know, that was just great. I mean, it was great. So uh, if you get a chance to meet Jasper Johns, I would do whatever you can to sort of take him aside and tell him how much you love his work. Um, there was one other aspect of the work at the Whitney, which I particularly liked. And it was a room that was called Small. And what Jasper had done, uh, I feel I can call him Jasper now after telling you that story. Um, he had uh, made these very small works um, that replicated his larger works. 
And so when you go into this room, it was interesting. They had painted the walls dark and there were several paintings in there. And um, they were, you know, there were targets and flags and there was um, numbers and there was, you, you know, his little works. Um, and so you could see all of all of these on a miniature scale. And it, yes, it reminds one of Marcel Duchamp's work and miniaturize it and put it in a, a, a briefcase because he felt, you know, that's how an artist should should really sell his stuff is in a briefcase like salesman. Um, but uh, but along with that reference, you see these works uh, that are maybe, you know, eight by 12 or maybe a little bit bigger and even um reduced uh, in this small way, they still have such presence and they still have such uh, meaning. And, you know, uh, uh, to see that uh, the meaning of these artworks are in the making is, again, um, just... uh, uh, revolutionary, because that is what painting is about. And so um, I will leave you with this. Sometime in the early 80s, there was a movie, uh, a film made called Art, Artists on Art. And um, it interviewed a lot of the artists who were, you know, in, in the early 80s, uh, Jim Rosenquist, Robert Rauschenberg, Jasper Johns. And they all sort of talked about what they did. Um, Jim Rosenquist talked about, you know, he gets up in the morning, he goes downstairs and he sort of works with colors and, you know, how great that is. And um, Jasper Johns was sort of just like standing in his studio and in his Southern accent, he just sort of said, I paint. And that was it. And um, thank God for Jasper John's painting. So thank you for listening. Um, If you have any questions, um, you can go to my website, artrep-dg.com. You can message me on Facebook. More than that, I do hope that you'll make uh, a serious attempt to go see these two shows um, because it is spectacular. So thank you so much.